Ironically, the vast amount of information that we have today is problematic because of redundancies, because of bit rot, because there's actually too much of everything. Um, I remember uh, William Gibson once said that um, the biggest challenge in the future would be to identify the original of something. Um, and he, he actually spoke of this new uh, figure, some kind of archi, um, architect, some, some kind of uh, designer that would be able to uh, find the version that was not changed or altered or modified by somebody. Um, and that's particularly um, relevant when it comes to video games because today we have emulation, we have so many different versions of the same game. We have remakes, we have ports, we have virtual machines. Um, ironically, we have so many versions of you know, something, but the real challenge is to find the thing that was you know, the original thing. Um, so to answer your question, um, it's a problem of TMI, as Americans like to say, too much information rather than lack of information. Um, maybe, you know, uh, not having some data sometimes could be a blessing in disguise. Uh, when it comes to technology, there's a long tradition of um, studies, historical studies. I had the chance to um, work at Stanford University, for example, uh, for five years, and uh, uh, the amount of information that they have in their archives is absolutely mind-boggling. Um, so, for example, they have the original archives of everything that Steve Jobs did for Apple. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's definitely interest, there's definitely a lot of um, material available. Now, when it comes to video games, that's a different story. It's much more recent. Um, there's a lack of coordination between different um, uh, institutes. There's a different. Um, there's a lack of standards. Even how do you? What do you save? How do you save it? What do you preserve? And why, and, and uh, uh, so there's there's for example some schools that um, are interested in emulation. Others are just interested in preservation, meaning that they want to. Uh, maintain you know, and, and preserve the original artwork, for example. Uh, others are more interested in making sure that 50 years from now we'll be able to play the games that um, we used to play, I don't know, in the 80s or 90s. Um, and that's a problem that is becoming more and more relevant as technology gets more complicated. Uh, if you try now to emulate a multi-core processor, for example, I mean, good luck. There's a definite interest in, in the matter. Um, it's bound to increase in the next few years as technology becomes more and more relevant to our everyday life. And there are places like, again, Stanford or Silicon Valley where there's a, an interest in preserving their history. Um, in a sense, for them, technology is, is to us what you know the Roman Empire used to be, right? So it's something that is relevant. They grew up with it, they developed, they invented, there's some pride, there's some issues. Um, so, but it's spreading, I mean, it's a global phenomenon, but it, right now it's concentrating in certain areas, Silicon Valley uh, being the one I'm familiar with, so. Um, Marshall McLuhan once said that we, we live in the age of revival. Um, we live in an age where the past is coexisting with the present and it's always it's almost pervasive it's always it's almost too much um, I remember a really good book by um, Simon Reynolds who's the music uh, critic for The Wire and the book is called La Retromania and it's really about how we at one point in time um, history kind of stopped actually when the internet became a thing right when the internet became so pervasive that um, all of a sudden everybody has this huge archives right available and basically what he says is that um, we, we basically forgot how to invent the future, okay? We are reveling in our past. We are um, remixing existing stuff. There's basically his, his main idea is that uh, music died in the 90s, right? When the internet became a thing. And therefore, all we do now is basically you know, allude to the 60s with the new bands that are basically recycling existing tropes and existing music and existing, th existing themes. And to be honest with you, I see the same in games, for example, where you have, you know, this constant deluge of uh, 
retro titles, remakes, uh, ports, um, and also sequels, because sequels are basically, you know, embedded in the past. It's about, you know, bringing back something that we were experiencing in a slightly different way. And so to answer your question, yes, I think that um, archiving is becoming a, a compulsion, uh, an addiction. Um, and Derrida wrote a famous essay in the 90s called um, uh, Archive Fever. So in a sense, we're all kind of like, you know, feverish when it comes to collecting and stuff. Uh, but I think this is also very important because when it comes to games, if it weren't for the collectors, we would have lost so much material because there was no um, core, um, um, organized institutional effort to save games, right? And especially in places like Italy, um, it was really the collectors who started amassing all of these materials. Uh, and I'm talking about hardware and software, right? And if it weren't for them, now we wouldn't even have museums that have you know, so much material, so much rich like material. So yes, it, it's, it's, it's compulsion, but it's also an healthy <laughs> compulsion, I think, because um, they basically led the way to start a movement you know, of game preservation that came later, right? Uh, so the Library of Congress, for example, a few years ago launched a massive, in the United States, launched a massive initiative to save and pre the, the, the games of the past. And this initiative was called Preserving Virtual Worlds, and I, and, I, and I took part of it. And if it weren't for the collectors, we would have never, ever uh, even, you know, begun to um, the project itself. So yes, it's okay, it's, a, it's an healthy compulsion, it's an, an healthy addiction. Video games pose a special challenge for preservation because they're so tied to technology, right? Um, they evolve and change so quickly that it's really hard to even imagine ways of preserving something that is, you know, so ephemeral, so transient. Um, there are ways of doing this, but none as being, um, how can I say, there are no standards. There are no uh, ways of doing um, the work of the collector. Uh, sometimes they compare um, game preservation to film preservation, but it's it's like apple and oranges. Um, ironically, it's way easier to preserve films that were produced um, a century ago than video games that were produced like even like 20 years ago because there's no hardware that can play them you know, successfully. And that, that becomes incredibly tricky when you are dealing with um, you know, special versions of games. I'm, think, I'm thinking about something like um, Seaman, which was a video game for the Dreamcast that used a microphone, for example. So the game, so the, 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 the microphone was the interface, was, you know, you, you talk to this weird character using your microphone. Now, there's a version of Seaman that is emulated, but it's unplayable because they didn't incorporate, like, the microphone option, right? Or, but sometimes, you know, technology can help you. I'm thinking about uh, Warrior Twist, right? which came out a long time ago for the, um, for the Nintendo um, uh, Game Boy, and he had a, a gyroscope, right? And so now every smartphone has a gyroscope, so you can really emulate that easily for something like you know, the, the Apple iPhone, okay? And so yes, emulation is definitely not the, the real thing, right? The, the original thing. Um, and I think the biggest problem is really not preserving games, but preserving gamers. And by that, I mean preserving the experiences that gamers went you know, through while playing the games, uh, it's not enough for me to preserve an arcade game. What about the arcade itself, the architectural space where you first experience these kind of games, right, in the 80s? That, that's lost forever because you know, arcades you know, disappear completely. Uh, it's funny because people were like, you know, um, talking about the end of cinema in the 80s, you know, when TV became like, you know, mainstream. And everybody was saying, look at the arcades, they've replaced you know, the movie theaters. And now, theater, uh, movie theaters are booming and arcades are completely you know, gone. So it's, it's kind of, that's again, it goes back to the idea of how technology changes so quickly and so fast. When it comes to online gaming, um, saving those experiences, it's really complicated and cumbersome and tricky. Um, one thing is you know, to sa uh, save and preserve Halo, the video game. But what about the multiple, multiplayer element and component of that game that, according to me, makes the game 
what it is, right? That's lost forever. That's really hard to preserve. And again, the, the only thing you can do is basically, you know, have videos or, you know, um, uh, footage, machinima. But again, it's transforming an interactive medium into something that is, you know, linear. And it, but at least you have something, right? But again, there are so many compromises and trade-offs that you have to deal with when you talk about game preservation. There's so many histories, right? There's a history of technology, there's a history of the industry, there's a history of um, production. But what I, I, I think is going to happen is there's going to be a history of consumption, a history of uh, performances within video game spaces. And I'm talking about specifically what people did with these games and in these games, especially when you're dealing with um, MMORPGs or online games that only exist, you know, as social spaces on, you know, remote servers. What what is really interesting? What people did? How did they subvert the rules of the game? Um, th you know, things like Leroy Jenkins' uh, catastrophic uh, raid within uh, World of Warcraft is already part of you know fandom studies. But uh, to answer your question, I really see the proliferation of investigations uh, on the kind of things that people did in these games. I'm, thinking, I'm specifically referring to social protests, for example, and, 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 and activism within uh, online spaces. I'm thinking about art interventions within, you know, happenings within video games as well. Um, I'm also thinking about subversions and modding. There's a history of modding, how people change the games, how people actually intervene on the code to alter it. Um, I think there are going to be multiple histories. And it, this is something that lies at the intersection of anthropology, sociology, history, um, technology studies, and history per se. So I think it's going to be a really exciting uh, future for the history of games. Dramatically, I think games and technology in general have uh, normalized the idea of tracking. The idea that everything that you do is going to be recorded, analyzed, archived forever, right? In a sense, you can't get rid of your past. You would be always haunted by the past and the burden of history. Um, think about The Sims, right? The game that came out in 2000 and it's still the best, you know, um, selling computer game of all time, right? And so that was the first game where every single action that you perform was tracked and analyzed. In fact, Electronic Arts used their servers to um, use the data, the, ga the, the, the game data, in order to improve the game, right? And so um, every single action, including like watching a painting in order to increase your cultural points, right, became trackable, right? And I see that game as a point of, um, as, as, as a turning point in the history of technology because eventually what we used to do in The Sims became our real life, right? Now everything that we do online is tracked. Everything, every like, every single uh, Google search is trackable. Yes, preserving the experience is a full-time job because as I said before, it's not really just about, you're not dealing with items or objects, artifacts, you're dealing with experiences, right? And in the case of video games, you're, for example, dealing with um, machinima, which are stories created with games, right? That um, are part of the game experience itself, I, I would argue. Um, but I'm also thinking about the practice of screen grabbing and photography, right? Game photography. And that's because video games are uh, not really stories to me, but more like spaces, right? And, and so playing a video game is more like um, going on, on a trip, like going on vacation, right? And you take photographs uh, in order to legitimize your experience, but also to give some kind of consistency, ontological consistency to something that is ephemeral, right? Something that, that disappears so quickly. And so now we have these gigantic archives of photographs taken by players of, of things they did in the games, right? There's a huge, for example, um, stream of glitches, right? The glitches, it's, it's, which, which I find fantastic because it's where the photorealism of the video game basically implodes, right? And disappears and, and, and the, the malfunction, the, 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 the error becomes visible. And, 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 and players kind of like, you know, collect these moments of uncanniness, right? 
And that's part of the, the game itself. And also, it's part of the history of the game because some of these problems or bugs are changed and transformed by patches. Or, so the, the game itself evolves and changes, right? Um, there are a few films that have this kind of, 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 of uh, itinerary. I'm thinking about a film like Blade Runner, which exists in like in 10 different versions and director's cut and extended cut and stuff like that. But if you think about games, games are organic. They're like, they, they change, they evolve, there are patches, they, they, they are extended, they are transformed, right? And gamers are actually sort of like um, saving um, instances, you know, moments of, of this transition, this evolution from oblivion. And therefore, their, um, their practice is as important as preserving the games themselves. So, yes, I mean, power to the gamers. <laughs>